Well, again, thank you guys for coming, spending a portion of your Christmas with us this year. Hopefully, it's already been a blessing to you to see the, the kids and, uh, and hear um, our brother John. By the way, he's one of the pastors here. If you don't believe me, uh, come back on Sunday and you'll meet him. Um, but yeah, we have a pastor who raps, so... Um, This is an honor for us to put on every year, just so you know. And if it's your first time here, we are really glad uh, that you're with us. An amazing team from New City Church pulls all of this off, from the decorating that you see on the stage and all around, all the planning, the setup, and the cleanup that will happen afterwards, the gifts that you guys all got, and hopefully if you didn't get a gift bag, you get one on your way out, because those were all thoughtfully put together by a group of people. And, um, and then the photography, the, you know, we, we have free, uh, amazing, a gifted woman here, Danica, who's going to take free family photos afterwards. So can I just have you all first just give a round of applause to those that helped? Awesome. Sincerely, thank you, New City Church team. So I was going over some Facebook memories back to six years ago with the first You Are Loved event, and it was different. <laughs> Let's just say it was different. Um, my wife and I and our, and our four kids and a few other people trying to pull off a Christmas service at the Maine Maritime Museum. And so God has done amazing things, and uh, we've come a long way. So we're going to sing a couple more songs at the end in just a moment, and then we're going to have some great food together. But I want to have an opportunity to share something extremely important with you. And to be very clear on this one thing, and that is this one thing, the way to eternal life. I want to talk to you about the way to eternal life. To do this, we're going to walk down a road together, and I'll have all of the scriptures on the screen, so don't worry about having to find your place in a a Bible. I really wanted this to be easy for anyone, especially not familiar with church or being in the scriptures, just to be able to see the words. And so make sure you direct your attention there. I want you to be able to follow along. And after tonight, you will all be able to say that you have heard the gospel, the gospel. It is so important that you know the gospel of Jesus Christ. And after tonight, you will, have been able, you will be able to say that you have heard the gospel, and may it be that we don't just merely hear it, but that tonight, this very night, if you need to, that you surrender to and believe the gospel. So we're going to begin in Romans chapter 3, verse 23. It says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And I know it sounds a little morbid for a Christmas night, okay? But this is just what we have to do. And we have to start here. Sin and glory next to each other in this text. And please leave these on the screen as I'm talking about them, if you guys don't mind, so we can make sure to keep watching them. But sin and glory side by side. God is glorious. God is holy. He's righteous. He is the creator. And he is king. And we have inherited the sin nature of our parents, each and every one of us inheriting what has passed, been passed down through our parents, all the way back to Adam, and we all have sinned against God. We fall short, as the scripture says. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You might ask, how bad can I be? If all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, how bad can I be? And the answer depends on who you compare yourself to. So I know each of you have compared yourself to other people. So if you compare yourself to others, another person, you might actually be pretty great. But compared to God, whose holiness is the standard of heaven, we all fall short. That must be the standard that we compare ourselves to, not to other people. That's easy. You're, getting, you're letting yourself off too easy. Compare yourself to somebody around you and you might convince yourself that you're a good person. Romans 3, 10 to 18, as it is written, none is righteous, no, not one, no one understands, no one seeks for God, all have turned aside, together they have become worthless, no one does good, not even one, their throat is an open grave, they use their tongues to deceive, the venom of asps is under their lips, their mouth is full of curses and bitterness, their feet are swift to shed blood, in their paths are ruin and misery, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Again, pretty morbid for a Christmas service, very necessary. This is the truth. If we were really honest, we would say, that's me. That's what I'm capable of. 
And it is the natural condition of the human heart. Every single person who sits in this room, this is your natural condition. To be opposed to God, to not seek God, in fact, to reject God. What has just been described is the depraved human heart. You could say that this is what everyone is capable of until the Holy Spirit of God intervenes in that person's life. And it's because of this sin nature and a person's choosing to sin against God that there is a wage that is earned. And this takes us to the next place in this road is Romans 6.23. The wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. There's just no way around this because God is holy and He is just and righteous. All that opposes His righteousness is worthy of judgment and that judgment according to God's word is death. Not just what happens at the end of your life here on earth, but the Bible calls this death separation from God forever, which is ultimate death. That is what all of us deserve, no matter how good you think you've been or or actually how awful you think you've been, for that matter. The only thing you can earn in your strength, according to God's word, is death. Thanks be to God that he does not leave us to fend for ourselves in this desperate situation. God's eternal redemptive plan has been in place forever. God himself would embark on this great rescue plan, become a man in the person of Jesus Christ who we have been singing about tonight, and step into our suffering and pain as someone we can relate to. God became a human being so we could relate to him, so we could see that God cares, has compassion, and he is willing to suffer like we suffer. God did this out of his merciful love for us. In Romans 5, 8, we read, but God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners. See, Jesus didn't come for the righteous. So if you happen to come into this room and you say, well, I'm pretty good, that first of all, according to scripture, is a false statement. You are not pretty good. We are depraved. We are wicked at heart and deserving of death. This is what the scripture has, says, has said. But Jesus didn't come for the righteous. He came for the unrighteous. That's good news. Because if you're willing to admit you're unrighteous, you're one step closer to admitting that you need Christ. You're one step closer to believing that you need a Savior. And even in our trespasses and sins, lying in a cesspool, a spiritual cesspool of our own making, Christ died for us as a gift in that very place. I hope it's becoming clearer. You can either live life on your own, attempting to do all things right, and in the end have wages that you've earned, which is death. That's one option. Or you can receive the gift of Christ's perfect life and sacrificial death by faith. There's one of two options that you must consider tonight. Salvation is of the Lord, the Bible says. That God is the one who saves, and it is God who saves by the miraculous working of His Spirit. God is the one who tonight can impress upon your heart your need for Jesus Christ. Regardless of who's around you or who brought you or who your, what your past is or what you believe tonight or what you used to believe and how you're believing today, none of that matters. What matters ultimately is that Christ came to save sinners like us. Salvation is of the Lord and it is God who saves. But God also supplies the means. So laying before you tonight is an invitation. And I beg of you to listen. Some of you here know Jesus Christ and you have eternal life and you are secure and you have peace. You could die this moment and you know where you'd be. You'd be in glory. You'd be with Christ forever. And you are at peace. Some of you are pretending like you're you're at peace when you're truly not. In the deepest part of your heart, you are not at peace. You do not know Christ. You've never met your maker and your savior, savior. And you are truly at risk of eternal damnation. And that's what the scripture teaches us. That's bad news, but there is good news. And that's what I want to tell you tonight. Romans 10, 9 says, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, 
you will be saved. People, I want you to have no doubt in your mind that this is why Jesus came to this earth. He came to show the world that he is God and that he is king. But is he Lord and king of your heart now in this very moment? Something is. Something has that place in your life of Lord and king. You worship something or someone. Whether it be a spiritual being or a physical thing that you worship in your life, we all worship something. And so what I want to do is invite you, along with Romans 10, 9, to confess him as such in your heart between you and God, not for my sake or for anybody that came with you or that brought you, but because what you're hearing is the truth and what matters more than the truth in this life. Nothing matters more than what is true. And also because I know that your sins are heavy. Sin is impossible to bear for the human being. So not for my sake or for anybody else's, but confess as such that Christ is king, that he is Lord, and that he has been risen from the grave. If Christ is truly raised from the dead, then he is, in fact, God. So whatever you worship or whoever you worship as God, I want you to just ask yourself this question. Did that being, has that person, has that thing ever died for you and risen from the grave? What power does the thing or the person or the spirit that you worship have that is like that? None. Only Jesus Christ. Only God has done this. And there are many pseudo-saviors and many who claim to be Christ and Messiah, but there is only one. Romans 10, 13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. There's actually a beautiful simplicity to that. I know in my own heart that there's some depths to that as well, but what I want you to hear is the beautiful simplicity of that. That if God's word says that someone can cry out in their heart to the Lord and that he will save them, that is the truth that you need to hear. For all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And so on the authority of scripture, I can tell you that a sincere confession of faith in Christ and the work of his blood shed on the cross will not only mean salvation for you, but that your heart will be made new. So you don't need to do better in this life. I know that there are many who say just, you know, do better, try harder. What is needed for sinners is a new heart, a brand new heart, a new creation. One that is not at enmity with God, but at peace with God. This peace is achieved by the work that Christ has done for you. Christ has done this work for you. Romans 5, 1, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you have peace with God tonight? Is there peace between you and the creator of all things? This is through Jesus Christ, this peace that comes, this justifying work that comes through faith. It's through Jesus. And and though on our own we stand as condemned, as we read earlier, by God in our sins, when we look to the perfect life of Christ, that he lived for us and the death that he died for us to atone for our sins, we take part in a great exchange, an incredible exchange, our sin record for his perfect record, our sinful record for his perfection. That's the exchange. That's salvation. That's what happens through Jesus and the justifying work that he brings. You ask yourself your, this question, do you have a sinful record and what is going to be done about that? Who has done anything about that? What can you do? Only Christ can do the work. God's justice was satisfied in the punishment of Christ because he stood as our substitute on the cross, Jesus substituted himself in our place. God's love was displayed for us in that Jesus did it all willingly. So not only at the cross do we see God's perfect justice and his judgment, but we also...
Is he a willing, loving God who stepped into humanity and all of the problems that we have, and he was willing to deal with the crux of the issue, and that is sin and the brokenness that, it come, that comes with it. For greater love has no man than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. And Jesus Christ displayed the greatest love that you could ever imagine. And he did it by laying his life down. Christ became sin so that we might become righteousness. And now for all who believe and trust in the name of Jesus, there is freedom, true freedom. Hear this, please. Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Ever felt condemned? Ever walked in condemnation? How about from another human being? The feeling of condemnation, the the reality of being condemned potentially in a court of law. Ever been condemned guilty? Well, there is a court system and it is divine. It is holy and the, the judge is perfect and nothing gets past him. In fact, he is so holy that no sin goes unpunished. It is either punished in the substitute of Jesus Christ or it is punished through our eternal damnation. And Christ took the payment for all who believe. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And this is the point of it all. Guilty sinners can be set free, can be changed, can be given a new life and new desires and a new position before God. No longer enemies, but sons and daughters. Sons and daughters of a loving, gracious Father who sent His Son to rescue us. And this is His love. The love that caused the Father to send His Son to us, to be born in a manger for us to grow up and serve, to live a sinless life and fulfill every law of God, to die a brutal death, to rise from that death, to crush our greatest enemy, sin and death. And I'm inviting all of you, all of us, all who have come here tonight, either in rebellion against God blatantly or a backslidden Christian who has fallen into sin and you know it, and you're not following Christ tonight. I just want to give that invitation that you would come to follow Christ. Don't worry about the person sitting next to you or anything that has happened. You've not done anything so bad that Christ cannot save you and does not desire to change your heart and give you a new life. Every single wrong that has been done when covered by the blood of Jesus is completely atoned for and covered. I'm inviting you all to believe, to repent and believe in him. So I'm going to ask the band to come back up now. We're going to get ready to light some candles, and we're going to have a couple more songs, then we're going to enjoy some food and some festivities and some things that we will do when we're done. But let me close with this. As they're getting ready, please continue to pay attention. And I would ask that those that were going to be lighting candles uh, in just a moment, get ready to do that, and I'll, I'll disperse you in a moment. And I'll give some instructions. But let me close with this. Romans 8, 38 to 39. It says, For I am sure, I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers or height nor depth or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the love I want you to hear about tonight. A love that that is so immense and so complete and so perfect that there is nothing in creation that can separate you from that love if you are in Christ Jesus. You've all experienced loves and attempts of being loved that have fallen apart. That does not happen in Christ. There is nothing that can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ. And this is the greatest love in all the world. What are you going to do with this information that you've heard tonight? That's the simple question I want to ask you is what are you going to do with this information that you've heard about Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the King, the one who suffered and died, the one who came to this world as a baby, God in human flesh. He claimed to be God. You know what else he claimed to do? You know what he claimed to be authority over? He claimed to be authority over every power of darkness. Every power of darkness. Darkness likes to veil itself in light and pretend to be light. 
Jesus Christ is the light of the world. Don't make any mistake about it. What you need and who you need is Jesus Christ. So what are you going to do with this information? No matter the power that grips you, the sin that enslaves you, the past that haunts you, the scars that you bear, Jesus invites you with these words. Matthew eleven twenty eight thirty. 28, 30. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Amen, brothers and sisters? All who have experienced this lifting of the burden of sin, you can rejoice tonight. You can rejoice tonight. You're at peace with God. All who have yet to come to Christ, you still bear a burden, and the only one who can lift it and take it is Jesus. And the only way is through faith in him and the work that he did on the cross, completed it. And he invites us to come to him and he will lift that load. He carries it with us and he will walk with us for our entire lives carrying the heaviest burden. So we should learn from him. You know, God's love is holy. God's love is jealous. He's pursuing your heart tonight. Because to give your heart to anything else is to be robbed of the greatest love that ever existed. The love of God in Jesus Christ. So as we worship and as we sing this next song about the love of God, I hope that what you'll do is think about a response in your heart. Respond to God by saying, yes, I know you have loved me. I see it. You gave your son for me. What do I love? Who do I love? And Will I love you in return? Will I believe what you've done for me? If you need to do that, I pray that God would He would draw your heart to Himself tonight. So we're going to go ahead and sing the song, and those that are going to light the candles can do that. Everybody can stand, and what they're going to do is light the candles on the end, and we need everybody's help to light everybody else's candle down the road. Don't burn each other, okay? Watch the kids. Keep everybody safe. We'll fill this room with candlelight, and we'll sing a couple more songs.